Hi everyone, coming to you again from lovely Vienna. Good to see that I'm changing my location within the city for each video. Uh, but we've just finished the third and final day of the Ectrums conference. And so once again, I thought I would just record a short highlights video to share with you some of the key presentations that I heard about today. Really, there were two main topics that were discussed today, and they're topics that I know are particularly interesting to our community. So hopefully these are, uh, this is a video that you find really interesting. So the two main topics were remyelination and myelin repair therapies uh, and the gut microbiome. So let me start with the remyelination aspect. So there's probably two levels that I want to talk to about this. One uh, we heard a number of presentations that were providing updates on some clinical trial results uh, that were testing potential myelin repair therapies. And it's fair to say that the results of these trials were relatively mixed. We did see a couple of trial results where they found that there was no benefit um, with the myelin repair therapy so that the therapy itself didn't outperform the placebo. Uh, and so we classify these trials essentially um, as failed trials. However, I think part of the key message to come out of this is that these failed trials are still telling us some really important factors. And one of the, um, I guess, messages that, that really highlights that is based on the results of the Bexaritine trial. So if you remember back to the MS Virtual 2020 meeting from last year, we did an interview with Dr. Will Brown from Cambridge where he talked about the Bexaritine trial, which is another potential myelin uh, repair therapy that they're working on at Cambridge or were trialling it at Cambridge. And what they found was, although this did appear to have some benefits for myelin repair, the side effects and the safety profile of bexaritine meant that it's not a treatment that will be pursued. But at this meeting, we heard another um, presentation on the bexaritine trial where they've done some extra analysis of those results. And what they think that they've seen in those results is that Age seems to be important in terms of how effectively this myelin repair therapy works. And, and this is in line with um, other studies mostly done in, in animal models where they've looked at the age of cells um, and their ability to promote remyelination. And in all of those studies, it appears that the younger cells uh, are much more likely to be able to do this. Now, it's important to state at this um, stage that that doesn't mean that once a person gets past a certain age, a myelin repair therapy won't work for them. And in, in fact, really what it means is that another aspect of the research that's going on in this area is to look at strategies that uh, are really related to um, elongate, elongating life or, or protecting longevity, I guess. And so one that we've already talked about before is metformin. Um, which seems to work in that space, as well as intermittent fasting. And you may remember a video that we've done, again, coming out of that Cambridge group where they looked at the results of both metformin and intermittent fasting and saw that both of those could promote myelin repair. And I think that part of that um, action is to do with the fact that they help um, slow the aging process. And so at the end of that, the presentation at this year's conference where the Cambridge group were, were presenting some of those results that did mention that they are looking now forward at a new trial where they'll be combining metformin. So this um, treatment that they've shown does have some effect um, in an animal model, but also with clomastine, another compound that has been shown to have potential for myelin repair. So I think it's that message of that even when we see these failed trial results, which can be somewhat disheartening, we are learning things out of it. And as I commented on Twitter after that session, you know, while it is disappointing to see failed trial results, um, what I think is exciting and a reason for hope in this is that we have so many different avenues that are being pursued in the myelin repair area. Two more things I want to say about remyelination and Probably the first thing is that in talking about remyelination and myelin repair, one exciting announcement that we made recently is that we've added Dr. Travis Stiles uh, to the MS Translate team. And this is obviously his area of expertise. So I can promise you that 
we will be talking about this session from Ekrams 2021 together and recording some content for you where Travis and I will discuss some of the results that we've seen and he will share his opinions and insights on that as well. If that's a video that you're interested in seeing, please do comment below and let us know that that's some content that you'd like us to create. As well as that, talking about some early stage remyelination um, work, uh, we did have another presentation during the late breaking session um, that was from a Dr. Kataria from the University of Manitoba. And so they've done some early work where they're looking at a compound called Neuregulin 1. And so they found with this compound um, that it's involved in uh, modulating inflammation. So it controls part of the inflammation process. Um, but they've also had some results that suggests it may be important for remyelination. And so they've done some extra testing um, with Neuregulin 1, um, both in an animal model where they found that treating these animals with the animal model of multiple sclerosis, known as EAE, when they treated it, those mice with Neuregulin 1, they found that that improved the clinical symptoms in these mice, but also that it improved um, or enhanced thickness of the myelin, suggesting that it can also do some myelin repair. It also preserved the axons, and we know that axon or nerve um, loss is something that also occurs in multiple sclerosis. So it seems that in this really early stage trials um, or studies, that Neuregulin 1 both um, can decrease inflammation, which we know is in, an important part of the disease process, so it helps treat um, in that way, but can also at the same time improve myelin repair. As well as that, it also seems to be involved in removing myelin debris. And we know that uh, the buildup of myelin debris seems to be something that really hinders the myelin repair process. So this compound, Neuregulin 1, it's really early in the process and we will continue to provide updates as they are published, but it seems to be having a lot of beneficial effects that hopefully could make it a potential therapy uh, for the treatment of multiple sclerosis, but also um, as a potential myelin repair therapy. So moving on to the, the gut microbiome session, the first talk that we had um, came from Professor Anne Katrina, uh, uh, Katrin Probstel from the University of Basel. And one of the really impressive things in this presentation was that she highlighted uh, a number of work a number of pieces of work that have happened over the past 12 months since our last conference. And it really just shows how quickly um, the field of gut microbiome research in multiple sclerosis is occurring. And so to highlight some of the key findings um, that they've had in these studies, what's really become clear is that in most of these studies, they are seeing that people uh, living with multiple sclerosis have an altered gut microbiome when they compare them to healthy controls. And this may be in terms of things like overall diversity um, of the gut microbiome. So, you know, more or less species being present, but also specific types of bacteria and parts of the gut microbiome that may be increased or decreased in people living with multiple sclerosis. Interestingly, they've also found some differences when they look at different subtypes of MS. So they've seen some different types of bacteria that seem to be specifically involved with progressive types of MS, as opposed to relapsing or emitting multiple sclerosis. And one of the difficult things that was discussed quite a bit in the session is in terms of the, the real chicken and egg um, philosophy. So, you know, how do we know whether or not the differences that we're observing in the gut microbiome in people living with multiple sclerosis are part of what is causing their multiple sclerosis or causing some progression or disease worsening in multiple sclerosis, or is actually just a side effect of the fact that they're living with multiple sclerosis. And that's still a question that researchers in this field are finding very hard to answer, but are working on ways to be able to get past that. Interestingly, um, Professor, um, Professor Probstel presented some of her own work as well from her own team um, in Basel. Um, and they've seen some interesting interactions between the immune system and the gut microbiome that seems to differ in people living with multiple sclerosis when they're in periods of remission, as well as when they're experiencing a relapse. 
So again, this indicates that maybe there's some interaction between the immune system and the gut microbiome that can actually trigger disease activity in people living with multiple sclerosis. Now, again, these are very early stage results and they need to be replicated and we need larger studies, but we're starting to see more and more about these links that are occurring uh, between the gut microbiome and multiple sclerosis. We also then had a talk um, from Dr. Stephanie Tanku from Mount Sinai um, in the US, and, and she covered a number of um, large areas that of things that are potentially linked to uh, being able to impact on the gut microbiome and change the gut microbiome. So there's some work, all of these were, were relatively small studies um, and there's not a lot of studies on, but just to show that different ways that people are looking at, how can they maybe modulate the gut microbiome to, tr uh, to act as a treatment for multiple sclerosis. So one such example is the use of probiotics. And in a, a small study, they did find that using probiotics in people living with multiple sclerosis, there was a decrease in markers that represent inflammation, so which we would see as being a positive thing for people living with multiple sclerosis. And then it did lead to a clear change in the gut microbiome in those individuals. And that change they found shifted it more from that a type of gut microbiome that they associate with being in people living with multiple sclerosis closer to being what they were observing in the healthy controls in that study. However, there are certainly more studies needed in that area. They also looked, uh, she also talked a little bit about the role that diet can play in this area. Um, and one of the studies that she talked about is the study of bile acids, which we've reported about before on MS Translate. This is work that's being done out of Johns Hopkins University um, in, the, in the United States. And the update on this is that through the studies that we talked about, where they were doing these in an animal model, they're now looking at doing an early trial in people with progressive multiple sclerosis to see the effect of these, these bile acids. There was also some talk about fecal microbial um, transplants. So this is the notion of taking, trying to alter someone's gut microbiome um, by transplanting fecal matter from a healthy donor um, and seeing whether that can shift the gut microbiome profile in these individuals. And there's not much that's been published in this area. She talked about two case studies. One case study where they did in a person with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, um, where there did seem to be some positive changes, both in terms of markers that they were monitoring, um, and also the individual had better balance um, and better walking. Uh, and in a second individual with secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, where after the, after the transplant, they did find that that person became clinically stable and it was reported that they were clinically stable for up to 10 years after that transplant. Now, this is very small numbers of people because they need a lot more work done in this area before we can really tell anything about it. One interesting point that um, Dr. Tanku did make about um, the FMTs is that although it's widely been regarded as a very safe um, form of treatment. There is maybe some emerging safety concerns that have come out from this, again, only in very small numbers, um, but where there was two cases from um, after this treatment where the individual received um, a drug-resistant form of E. coli as part of that transplant. And this led to some serious health complications and actually one of the individuals um, that did develop this did die. So this, is, again, is an emerging area. We don't have a lot of information about the potential benefits nor about the potential safety risks, but it is, uh, again, something that we'll continue to provide updates on. There's another study um, done uh, by Dr. Zhu out of the University of California, San Francisco, and this is using the um, a big cohort that's looking at the, the gut microbiome um, internationally and people living with multiple sclerosis. And so in this particular project that they were looking at, they had 576 pairs of people from around the world. And these pairs included a person living with uh, multiple sclerosis and one healthy control from their household. And so there were a number of different results that they managed to find out of this, but probably what I found the most interesting was that they could see a couple of different things that seem to be impacting 
um, on the gut microbiome. One was in terms of disease modifying therapies, and they found that some of the disease modifying therapies that um, the person living with multiple sclerosis was on um, seemed to normalize the gut microbiome, so seemed to shift it back to what they were seeing in their healthy controls. So again, they had seen that there was a difference between when they looked initially uh, overall, there were differences between the gut microbiome between the people living with MS and the healthy controls. But when they looked further into those results and looked at some of the disease modifying therapies, they found that some of those therapies could shift that gut microbiome in the people living with MS to more resemble what they were seeing in the healthy controls. Similarly, they looked at the role of diet and in particular fruit intake. Um, and they found that in individuals with multiple sclerosis with higher levels of fruit intake, that again seemed to shift their gut microbiome to more resemble what they were seeing in healthy controls. Again, that's quite new data, more, need, more work needs to be done in it. But it's interesting to see that some of these factors that we um, associate with being able to manage multiple sclerosis, whether that's diet in terms of a lifestyle modification or whether that's disease modifying therapies, maybe we're starting to see that part of the way that they exert these benefits is through altering the gut microbiome. So again, some really interesting sessions. It has been a very big three days um, of conference, but I can leave you with the fact that it is certainly not over. While the meeting may have finished, um, there are many more talks and many more posters that we will be looking through and watching to be able to provide you information on those. The way that the conference works is there's usually about six to eight sessions running at any one time. And obviously Travis and I can only be watching um, one or two sessions live. Uh, and so we choose the ones that we want to report on immediately, but we will be continuing to spend time to go back and review those other ones so that we can report back. As I've already mentioned, Travis and I will be doing some combined content together. So please let us do know in the comments below the video if there's any topics that you've heard about during these daily summary videos that you want to hear a more detailed chat about between Travis and I, and we'll be happy to record those for you. I'm also sure that we'll be doing some Facebook Live broadcasts uh, as part of our coverage of this, where we'll be able to answer some of your questions directly. So thank you very much for your interest over the past three days. The engagement that we've received has been fantastic. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it and found these videos informative. Uh, it's, uh, as I've said in the other videos, we're now at about 4.30 a.m. here in Melbourne. I'm going to try and catch up on a little bit of sleep, but thank you again for watching, and I look forward to talking to you all soon. Thanks.